So we get started. Uh, so the title of the talk is uh, Computation Using Structured Measurements in Quantum Systems. So we are going to be looking at <coughs> computation um, in quantum systems using an information theoretic perspective. Um, <coughs> so this is the joint work with my students, Tawhid, uh, Mohsen, uh, Muhammad, and Darun. Um, so we get started. All right, so I, I would like to have this uh, outline here for the talk. So we're going to be talking about two kinds of problems. One is uh, measurement compression. So what we call measurement compression in a distributed setting. And then uh, the channel coding problem, which is communication uh, of information over uh, channels, quantum channels. <clears throat> uh, so here the perspective is something like this. So in information theory and maybe even in computer science, uh, if you want to achieve something, we do uh, we do randomization, and it's called random coding in information theory, because construction of any one particular encoder and decoder would be quite hard. So what we do is we do random coding. So that means we co we construct a class of uh, encoders and decoders, and we put a probability distribution, and it's called an ensemble, and we find the average performance of the ensemble, and then we uh, say that uh, there exists at least one uh, system that satisfies the guaranteed performance and the tradition in information theory has been to construct these ensembles <coughs> um, which are which are sometimes you know called as unstructured uh, ensembles in other words we don't put any any structure to that ensemble we just randomly choose uh, in some sense code words from some alphabet and we analyze its performance but it turns out when the number of parties is more than two, that means there is a conference among three parties or three agents, it turns out uh, uh, putting additional structure on these codes would help the communication. And that's where the structure is coming. And in particular, we are talking about algebraic structure, like for example, linear codes. Uh, although it's been studied in information theory and coding theory, even in computer science, mainly for computational reasons. Uh, we want to uh, do fast encoding and decoding with computationally efficient encoding and decoding, so we use linear codes. However, in information theory, uh, in the last decade, it has come to uh, dawn upon us that structure now can be used to gain performance, not just for computational reasons, but even for attaining asymptotic performance gains. So that's the, the high level, um, you know, the lesson that we want to learn from this talk. <clears throat> so I'm going to first talk about uh, measurement uh, or what we call a, a, a QC system where the input is quantum, the output is classical. That's part one. And then we go to the channel coding problem in which case we have uh, a classical input and quantum output. So we're going to be looking at hybrid systems where the one of the inputs can be either classical or quantum and the output can be classical or quantum. So here is our first uh, Quantum measurements, we want to, you know, quantum measurements are <coughs> uh, an interface between quantum systems and classical uh, classical world that we live in. And we associate a classical index to a quantum attribute. Um, so here, um, um, let's see, let me try to <coughs> expand this a bit so that I don't need to, yeah. So, uh, and uh, we, we, we model a measurement using uh, what, what we call a, a positive operator value measure uh, in the sense that it's a collection of operators, lambda j, which are positive, semi-definite, and they form the resolution of identity. So this is, uh, <clears throat> and uh, we do the measurement and the probability of getting a particular outcome is given by the trace of the corresponding operator with the density operator sigma of the state of the quantum state so again i would like to encourage you to ask questions and clarify doubts if you have any <clears throat> so now uh, we can talk about uh, <clears throat> storing or uh, storing or uh, transmission of these uh, measurement outcomes now how do you do that so for that we want to model a quantum source quantum information source so there are multiple ways of doing that and one approach is something like this. So let us say we have a quantum source which outputs a state with density operator sigma i with some probability pa of i, okay? And then we do the measurement. 
and we get some outputs j with certain probabilities and then we can talk about the joint statistics here which is uh, which is the the joint statistics here which is a p of uh, a x of i comma j so that's the given that it is in state i say sigma i what's uh, what's the probability that you're going to get a, uh, an output j which is given by this joint statistics now we can ask the question how many bits are required to store the outputs of a quantum measurement so <clears throat> if you if you look at it uh, it will be producing outputs at some uh, at some rate and uh, we are going to be now assuming that uh, the states are product states that means like uh, for simplicity we will start making some assumptions here that we have multiple copies of the state row what we call iid source and we do a product measurement everything is simple here and then we get uh, outputs and based on basic uh, information theoretic argument we can see that the if you don't do any compression then the uh, the bits are going to be coming at rate of log uh, at at uh, you know um, at log n uh, log uh, n times log of the cardinality of x and if you do classical compression on that you get n times h of x bits uh, for uh, for compressing that uh, output of the measurement acting on n samples of the quantum source right does that make sense <clears throat> so this is uh, so the question now is can we reduce uh, uh this rate uh below the entropy uh which is n times h of x okay and the idea here is that it turns out there is some additional redundancy that's going to be there in a quantum measurement called quantum redundancy and we want to exploit that okay allowing for small tolerance for reconstruction imperfections which we call a you know like reconstruction in the shannon sense that we allow a little bit of error you know a little bit of uh, <clears throat> wiggle room so here is the problem that was formulated by winter in 2004 where he said that so suppose you have now the the system which is shown on the left which is a product system with a product source and a product measurement uh and we want to approach or we want to make a, a, you know approximation to this using a non-product measurement the source is still product but in the non-product like n letter which we call n letter measurement that's a measurement on the space of you know um row tensor n and uh, we want the joint statistics to be very close in total variation so in other words uh, it will be hard to tell whether uh, we are using the product or the non-product measurement and in the process we want to minimize the amount of bits that is stored because in information theory we want to in in the in the case of storage problem we want to minimize the rate of transmission rate of storage <clears throat> and uh, so this is uh, like a classical uh, uh, constraint which is a total variation uh, but we can also restate this in the in the fully quantum setting which is or uh, shall we say in the in the, in terms of density operators and the measurement operators which is uh, which we call as the faithful simulation problem so Sandeep, I have a question. If yes, why, go ahead, go ahead. Why why we want to go from a product form to non-product form? Uh, there is any reason? Do uh, you expect better compression? What? what that's right. The, that's right. That's right. Yeah. The, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So so the idea is that uh, what is the yes good question, and the answer is that we 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 hope to use this pro non-product measurement to reduce the rate of transmission in terms of minimizing the required storage beds. Remember that if you were to look at the product uh, state and we do cl classical compression, we get uh, the bits at the rate of entropy of x, which is the, the output of the measurement. Uh, and if you're using n samples, you get n times entropy of x. And now we want to reduce it below that, below that limit, below the entropy limit. And we plan to use this additional structure that we have, which is the non-product, and we want to make it happen. Does that make sense, Vertek? Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Okay. The, the uh, only uh, okay but later when when I hear more, I might ask more questions if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, sure. Feel free to ask questions. So here is uh, a uh, the problem formulation uh, done by <coughs> um, considered by Winter. So he said that uh, so the uh, there are two parties here, two agents, Alice and Bob, 
Alice looks at the state and does measurement non product M hat n and then she wants to store those bits in some location and Bob is going to look at that and reconstructs the output of the measurements and we allow for classical uh, randomness resource to be shared between the two parties okay so the common common uh, common randomness is like additional resource that we are allowed to share but it is not being transmitted okay so the transmission rate is r which the measurements have to be done at that rate and winter showed that if you are allowing for this common randomness then you can actually reduce the uh, rate of transmission from entropy to mutual information so uh, so so here is the 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 entropy uh, and here is the the the, the this is the the uh, you can think of it as either as the uh, the entropy of the output or the the Shannon entropy of the output or it's the uh, you can also relate to the one m entropy here um, and the the mutual information here is quantum mutual information and it is uh, smaller than the entropy so by red by using this non product measurement we can actually reduce the rate of transmission even below the entropy limit okay and go all the way up to mutual information between uh, x x is the output and you might ask hey what is r r is the reference of the state row so remember in quantum systems when you do the measurement uh, the state is uh, state uh, is, is is corrupted so state is gone so what remains is the reference so we can measure the relationship between the output of the output of the measurement with the reference and uh, that's what we are talking about here when we talk about the mutual information because in, in many information processing systems uh, what happens is uh, we do the so we have a source and uh, we do the measurement and that's gone because it's corrupted now because you know we did the measurement so we we uh, so that's kind of gone now so we, we will uh, take a proxy for that which is the reference and we measure all correlation with respect to that proxy which is the uh, which is the reference okay so all mutual information that you're going to see are with respect to that reference r which is a proxy for the quantum source whereas in classical uh, information processing we can always copy because we, you know we are not bound by the no cloning theorem all right so this is the <clears throat> the problem setup which is the two agent problem and uh, so here is uh, the problem that uh, studied by winter any question here guys uh, any again you know feel free to ask questions and clarify doubts all right so let's proceed so uh, there has been a lot of work in this on this topic uh, actually starting from 1970s where you know people were looking at uh, what is the information content of quantum measurement and how do we reduce that rate of uh, rate of uh, storage and the recent works being uh, by Anshu, Jane and Wasi where they looked at uh, the uh, one shot uh, approach to this problem. So here is our <coughs> three agent problem. So I told you that when, when, three, when there is confidence among three agents, that's when a lot of action happens and uh, we want to use structure in that. Okay. And that's when computation also happens. So here is the three agent uh, formulation. So we have now entanglement. We want to bring in entanglement here. So we have an entangled source rho shared between Alice and Kali. They look at their cor corresponding constituent components and they would like to do measurements. So measurements on entangled state is, is a well-studied problem. And they would like to now compress their measurement output at rate R1 and R2 to be sent to Bob. And uh, they share common randomness, the all the, the uh, Alice and uh, Bob and uh, Kali and uh, Bob at rate C1 and C2. And now from the Bob's perspective, we want the whole system to look like a product measurement. So the idea is that uh, when we are doing measurements, <clears throat> if you are doing multiple copies of the measurement, it's very expensive. We want to reduce the number of measurements and uh, uh, we want to reduce the rate of transmission. So here is the three, uh, three, uh, three uh, agent version of the problem that I talked about. And here, uh, so as I said, uh, there is a common randomness, which is the C1 and C2, so which we can you know, uh, call it as C, C1 plus C2. The, the Alice's POVMs that has to be designed, uh, Alice and Carly's. And what does Bob do? Bob gets two indices L1 and L2 from Alice and Carly. 
and Bob also receives this common information index. So there is a computation going on here. And Bob would be producing, Bob could uh, produce uh, some output uh, with some stochastic uh, <clears throat> stochasticity there. So some, some local randomness Bob can use to produce the reconstruction. Okay. So the, the action of Alice is doing measurements, analytical measurements, act, action of Kali is analytical measurement. Action of Bob is doing this classical processing, which combines the index that's been sent by Al, uh, the Alice and Kali and, uh, and the, uh, the common randomness. And the, of course, we want to satisfy the faithful simulation condition. And we want to minimize all the rates R1, R2 and C1 plus C2. And how do we do that? Well, we have a, a result for that. Uh, I just want to, you know, um, flash that uh, result here, but we will uh, 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 quickly go to the next step here, which is uh, uh, the key important points because it's kind of a little complicated. So I want to say show some pictures and uh, say what happens. So as in the as in the point to point case, point to point in the sense that Alice and uh, Bob case, uh, adding common information helps in reducing the rate of transmission. Right. So even in uh, in the case of uh, in the case of uh, uh, winter's problem by adding common randomness, which is somewhat, uh, you know, maybe somewhat cheaper resource than sending beds, uh, we can actually reduce the rate of transmission. So in this case, the rate goes, uh, you know, we can reduce. So this is uh, the x axis is rate R1 and y axis rate R2. We can actually reduce the rate of transmission. Okay. So the green region is the one when you when you don't have common randomness, that's when you have to send at rate, you know, the entropy of U and V. Uh, where u and v are now the measurement outputs and we can reduce the rate of transmission to this blue region. Okay, still all uh, constructions here are done in a random fashion. So note that uh, there are a lot of points that are worth noting here. Even in the case of winter, <coughs> that uh, when you are constructing these measurements, these are n-letter measurements, how do you construct them? And uh, we are talking about asymptotic results here. So in the sense that as n becomes large, we want to approach the uh this this result here so so remember that uh, the faithful simulation condition is an asymptotic condition and it, it should approach zero as n tends to infinity uh and that means that all measurements have to be done on a on a you know on exponentially large sets and how do we construct that well we do random coding you know just uh, pick from the corresponding alphabet code words and from that we construct measurements okay <clears throat> So similarly, even here, we do the same thing. And uh, there have been some, uh, you know, additional works in this area. So which is reconstruction of the source, uh, the quantum source itself. But, uh, you know, and uh, people have done a uh, lot of things here, Datta et al. You know, I want to bring to your attention previous works, a lot of works on this, on this topic. Uh, and uh, I want to now uh, start talking about the key ideas. Okay. <clears throat> So first of all, uh, so what are the key ideas? The one is that till now, what we have been doing is uh, the processing of three agents. And uh, we want to approximate measurements of Allison in a, in a, you know, using non-product. So we would uh, have this something called a mutual covering lemma, which basically says that if Alice does, uh, you know, uh, approximation to her measurement, and Kali does uh, approximation to her measurement, which is MB, then the joint would be also close to the product measurement. Okay, so this is, uh, this is pretty simple stuff. The next part is that is the following. Uh, so now they did the measurement. <clears throat> the previously what was happening is that we were just compressing one, one, uh, one input, which is coming out of uh, Alice. Now Alice and Kali are both compression are doing compression, and if you have been aware of the uh, the idea of doing measurements on entangled state, we see that the outputs are statistically related, right? So and this is this has been known since you know uh, since long time. You know the even with like a Bell state and you know EPR paradox, all that stuff is based on correlation that is there in doing measurements on on entangled states. So when Alice and Kali do measure uh, do measurements, they produce correlated outputs even in the pro non product uh, uh, measurements, and that has to be compressed more efficiently. 
and uh, so in the sense that 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 correlation cannot be simply you know you can't simply just locally compress it in the in the usual sense we need to do something like a binning so in other words we have to go we have to exploit this statistical relationship between the indices produced by Alice and Alice and Macaulay in a distributed fashion and that requires something called hashing it's been studied in information theory under the name of binning and the computer scientists study this under the name of hashing so you you kind of hash in the sense that you you induce a many to one transformation and go beyond your you know the standard compression of producing you know putting one index for every outcome so here is that kind of a, a cartoon for that we are putting many of these <coughs> code words in one basket and sending that index okay so now so till now it's all like a, a prior work so now we want to look at computation and using structure so i said as i said earlier when there is interaction among three parties there's something new thing comes up which is uh, the algebraic structure can help uh, your your uh, your uh, your uh, situation so here is another problem which has been studied uh, by Kerner and martin in the 70s this is a classical problem. So we have Alice and Kali again. This is all classical. We want to build some intuition here before we go to quantum. Because if you want to learn quantum, you need to be, you know, you, you need to be good at classical. So let's look at why structure helps in when, when there is interaction among three parties. And this is where computation also comes into picture. So here we have Alice and Kali. Now they are observing two components of a classical source. This is completely classical with joint statistics given by x1 and x2. So Alice observes, let us say, uh, so let's say Alice is in Ann Arbor and Kali is in Purdue. And uh, we know the temperatures in Ann, in Ann Arbor and Purdue are uh, are related. So Alice uh, would do measurement in uh, Ann Arbor and Kali would do measurement in Purdue. And temperature measurements, and clearly temperature measure measurements are correlated. I mean, they want to send that uh, data to, let us say, CNN station, weather station. And uh, suppose say Bob is at uh, the weather station, uh, central processing unit, and Bob wants to only note, uh, note the difference of the temperature. He doesn't want to know the actual temperature, but only the difference. So how do we compress? So this is like what we call a computation. So x1 plus x2 here for the case of binary. <clears throat> so uh, this, this uh, the, uh, the, the problem of reconstruction of the complete source x1 and x2 was studied by Slepian and Wolf in the 70s again. And they uh, showed that you can compress at a total rate of the joint entropy. So one strategy for Bob is to reconstruct the sources x1 and x2 and then do the computation. Right? So, so in other words, it's a purely transmission problem, purely storage problem. You, you do separation of storage and computation. You do complete storage. That means basically you, you want to reconstruct x1 and x2. Some of you do that and total rate of transmission would be the joint entropy. And then do your computation. That would be, as I said, separation of transmission and computation. However, Corner and Martin came up with this ingenious strategy where they said you can actually compress below that and you can do computation on the fly. So it's not going to be separation approach, it's joint information storage and computation. Okay. And and they showed that this the this following rate is achievable. In other words, uh, it's going to be <coughs> the it's as if they you know they, they both had access to x1 plus x2. So they don't have access to the difference. Alice is only anabos temperature and Kali is only Purdue temperature, but they somehow I'll tell you how to do that um using using structure codes. Using structure codes here means that algebraic structure codes and in particular linear codes. And now the question is, this is a motivational example and how does it help to our problem <coughs> in the following setting? So how does it, how does it, uh, how does it matter here? Well, it matters because remember, Bob's strategy here is information fusion. He has to fuse information sent by, uh, by Alison Kali. And in that process, he has to do some computation. So he can do local processing using some any local randomness. So he can produce his output Z based on U comma V. 
and that could be for example something like this so where you might want to first uh, produce a computation of u on on u and v and then produce a reconstruction so there are a lot of challenges here <clears throat> uh, in extending these ideas so note that most of the techniques that are used in uh, even in quantum information theory they are based on random unstructured codes because most of the codes that are studied in even in quantum information theory they are constructed out of classical codes and how do we how do we construct classical codes in information theory random random unstructured codes from any uh, any arbitrary distributions now we want to do all of this using random linear codes and what are the challenges you might wonder the challenges are if you have studied lin random linear codes you note that uh, it only induces uniform distribution on the alphabet because it's so symmetric uh, so all uh, you know if you look at any one if you take uh, the average of all the code words and if you see that one distribution that's going to be uniform because the code words are going to be all over the place that's one problem whereas if you have if you've seen capacity achieving code for example if you want to achieve capacity for certain channels the capacity achieving input distribution may not be uniform so what the shannon strategy was to choose from that distribution and you construct a code out of that okay that is linear codes they can only induce uniform distribution that's one problem second problem is that when we construct code words in information theory we do with mutual independence all code words are chosen independently mutually independently Whereas uh, random uh, random uh, structure codes, like uh, random linear codes, they come only with pairwise independence. So many of the techniques, for example, Chernoff bound and covering lemma, which have been studied in information theory, uh, quantum information theory, they, they, exp they use the mutual independence, so they cannot be used. So what are the ideas here? <clears throat> the idea is to achieve the non-uniform distribution, what we do is we do not one code, but we use a collection of codes so i'll tell you what that is as we go along so if, if you do one linear code you cannot use a non-uniform distribution so we need to use a collection of linear codes and somehow we can we can we can induce uniform non-uniform distribution so, <clears throat> and then the second idea is something called pruning because uh, you know we cannot use turn off bound and turn off bound is one of the, uh, the operator turn off bound i'm talking about here it's a very important tool and it ensures that whatever you're constructing is a valid POV. Excuse me. <clears throat> so we need to we need to come up with some new strategies here and that's what I'm going to talk about. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about the pruning uh, situation. So the idea here is something like this. So now uh, we are we are going to be constructing these uh, code words from a la random linear course and out of that we create a POVM and uh, so what happens is that uh, when you are constructing them uh, the the operators themselves may not be uh, may not satisfy you know this constraint that there's a resolution of identity it may not be not, not equal to, you know not less than i uh, we want it to be less than i means you can at least add one operator to make it complete but if it is not what we do is we prune it we essentially throw away the eigenvalues which are more than one that's one simple idea that we can use to address this problem okay so that that means that we will be always get guaranteed to have a turn off uh, the 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 constraint that it is a povm however it comes with additional approximation error and we have some <clears throat> technique for addressing that and this is something like a, a small inequality that comes up uh, which says that if you do this pruning operation then uh, the uh, the expected value of this trace of the difference um, can be bounded with the expectation of the uh, the norm of the difference okay so this is like you can think of this as like a markov inequality uh, but it is a slight tightening of the markov inequality in markov inequality we say what's the likelihood you know the cl the classical markov inequality is saying what's the probability x greater than some constant a and we upper bound that by the expectation right now here uh, in the operator case again that we have the operator markov inequality which says the probability that it is uh, not uh, less than um, some 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 operator and here we have a slight tightening of that okay so that's that's one idea uh, <coughs> 
and then we have some more ideas here um, I'm going to skip a little bit of that uh, because of lack of time uh, some of the techniques uh, which are you know this operator concavity and operator monotonicity could be used and hold us inequality and stuff like that and we can we can create we can we can construct this uh, one one big uh, covering lemma which says uh, how how we can cover the um, cover the uh, the uh, the measurements using these operators okay so i'm not going to go to the details of that uh, but i'm going to give you an example okay <clears throat> so here is uh, the simple uh, situation we have the bell state so alice and uh, kali are looking at a bell state uh, alice is looking at one 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 qubit and and kali is looking at the other qubit and uh, we want to do this measurement let us say given by this lambda 0 and lambda 1 and here f2 stands for the the finite field of size 2 and um, let us say that bob wants to do this processing and now let's focus our attention on equation one. Let's see what it is doing. What is Bob doing is Bob wants to compute uh, zero plus uh, whatever is the uh, the uh, the the input that's been sent by Alice and Kali. He wants to add them. Okay, so that's why we have lambda zero, lambda zero, and lambda one, lambda one. Okay, so that means that he is not interested in Z, you know exactly reconstructing that that outcome that's been sent by Alice and Kali he wants to do the computation he wants to do uh, u plus v okay. so so Sandeep a question if they yes. <laughs> if you have burst and Talgalman how you can com separate them to compute the sum zero plus zero uh, I don't understand so like uh, Alice will be sending the index uh, they, they both do the same measurement ma equals mb Mm -hmm. And there are two me two measurement operators, lambda zero, lambda one, right? Now Alice will do measurement, and Alice will send an index, and it would be taking one value in F two. Let us say zero comma one. F two is basically binary alpha binary field of size two. And uh, and Kali also does that uh, operation. So Alice does uh, measurement, and she is going to say uh, zero or one. And Kali is also going to do the same thing, and she's going to send zero or one. It's a very simple situation. But the measurement is on the entanglement uh, bell. Yes. State. Yes, on the on the bell state. Okay. Okay. So you can think of it as uh, like a you know what studied in EPR paradox or whatever it is, right? Uh, CSSH uh, inequality where we do measurements on entangled states. Now, um. They're doing the identical measurements on the corresponding constituent qubits. And Bob wants to do is computation. Bob wants the sum of those outputs. So that's why we have this <coughs> operators coming like that. Lambda 0, lambda 0, and lambda 1, lambda 1. So that means 0 plus 0 is 0, and 1 plus 1 is one, uh, 0. Whereas in the other case, uh, he wants to do, if it is 1 and 0, he wants to compute 1. And zero plus one is one. So now, what shall Alice and uh, Kali do to affect this measurement? Does it make sense? So, so Alice is doing a measurement. Kali is doing a measurement. Bob wants to do computation. I mean, Alice doesn't want to now send the entire thing. However, Alice cannot compute what uh, Bob wants because Alice only seeing what she sees. Okay. So uh -huh. now we can do the uh, so so we have the uh, the the rates. So Alice is going to produce U as the output, and Bo and Kali is going to produce V as the output, and we can do simple computations of these entropies. These are one-number entropies of these uh, these these quantities, and we can do these uh, mutual informations. And <clears throat> If you do uh, 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 the unstructured codes, which are random unstructured codes, which, which I talked in the beginning, your rate of transmission would be this one, which is the joint entropy, which is 1.515 or 54 cube uh, beds. And now if you, if you do structured coding, as I said, using this, this all these spiel that I gave you about, 
you know using uh, using uh, you know pruning and you know linear course and all that business you can actually reduce the rate of transmission so this is like joint measurement and computation okay and the gain that we get is is this so we can reduce the rate of transmission 48 you know minus 48 uh, 4 bits so here you can you can wonder uh, a few things uh, worth noting one is that oh uh, Alice uh, the uh, Bob wants to compute uh, you know linear function it's a linear function right u plus v is a linear function in the finite field we are talking about finite field of size 2 it's a linear function and we have linear codes oh, well well that's a match made in heaven everything works out what if the function is not linear right so so when the function is linear that is u plus v then everything works out nicely then you use linear code business you know done you know business closed now here is next example <clears throat> so we are going to now look at non-linear example so again it's bell state as before entangled state and I, i've chosen some lambda zero lambda one here uh, so <clears throat> another set of measurements again uh, Alice and Kali do, does uh, you know do same same uh, same measurements on their corresponding qubits now uh, Bob wants to compute the logical R function not the addition the logical R and logical R is is uh, is a function which appears nonlinear in the finite fields of size 2 Right? because uh, the uh, the Allison both parties produce only two uh, the uh, the measurement with only two outcomes zero and, and zero or one but Bob wants something nonlinear which is R function logical R function and what do we do so that is the equation two here which is logical R function right so either zero or one if any one of them is one it is one as I said logical R function looks highly nonlinear in a finite field of size two so what we do we go to a higher field and we kind of linearize that in the sense that we embed this uh, logical R function in a higher field and here is the table that I'm displaying on A that's the logical R function truth table right so it's going to be it's going to be that and now here on B we have the addition table of on a ternary field I go to a higher field okay F3 which is the addition module of 3 so now here what we see is that 0, 0, 0 uh, or 0, 0, everything is good, but 1, 1 plus 1 would be 2, not 1. But it's more information than what is required. And we can use codes now built on F3 for a binary problem. So what I do is I shift, I, I kind of embed this function which appears nonlinear into a function which is linear in F3 computes more than what's necessary but at least it's linear and I kind of map back the 2 to 1 at the receiver at, at the Bob's end so although the problem is binary everything is binary here and, and non-linear I go to a higher field I embed it in a higher field structure and uh, and I get a I, I get a, a linear function out of that <clears throat> and I do my codes now on a ternary curve now you might wonder hey how do I get binary code words from a ternary linear code it turns out you can do that so um so ternary ternary linear code is set of all linear combinations on this on this alphabet of size three but there are code words which are still binary which contains only zeros and ones and if you do this if, if you if you take appropriate appropriate shifts of this uh, ternary linear code you can actually do that okay and with all uh, with all of this uh, you know we can now do computation now uh, so Alice and Bob now use ternary linear code, although the problem is everything is binary, but they still do ternary linear code and they have to send zeros and ones because they can't send two because two is forbidden uh, and Bob receives zeros and ones from Alice and Nakali. He does computation which is uh, ternary and then uh, so, so all the reconstruction would happen as if it's on a ternary field and he gets sometimes two. He doesn't need that two, he'll just map it to one. And he's going to be happy and uh, when all said and done we can do the the bottom line is the how much gain we get we can now do the computation which be the end of and the whole idea of uh, computable characterization is that we can do comp we, we can compute the asymptotic performance 
and you see that by by going to the ternary field we can actually get gains beyond what's given by uh, unstructured codes so here the problem is now the, it's not a you know uh, the, the the logical R function is not a good match but we still uh, uh, you know uh, perform better than unstructured codes so this is where structure is coming in and computation because we want to compute something and we do joint computation measurement in this problem okay so <clears throat> so before I go further I'd like to maybe take a you know, um, uh, take questions, any questions here from the audience? Um, I have a question, Sanjit. Yes. Um, so here, if we go beyond the uh, finite fields, and uh, if we have uh, functions that we need to embed them into probably not higher finite field, but probably lower structures, for instance, group codes, uh, group structures. Uh, what do we know about those uh, scenarios? Yes, <clears throat> good question. So the question is, yes, why restrict yourselves to yourself to uh, finite fields? Um, um, yes, so uh, one can do uh, code server groups and codes over groups have been studied uh, for example uh, maybe that maybe the, for example they could uh, Alice and Bob wants to do measurement on a, on a quaternary alphabet and Bob wants to do addition modulo 4 now clearly addition modulo 4 is not a finite field um, so the the question is how do we do that and the question is uh, you know what what we can do about that <clears throat> well um, like the codes on linear uh, like uh, on finite fields people have studied codes on uh, rings they, they're called rings actually uh, because uh, they don't have you know all the, all the elements don't have multiplicative inverses for x2 for example 2 times 2 would be 4 which is 0 in a in an addition modulo 4 so that means uh, 2 doesn't have a multiplicative inverse and uh, there is there's going to be some penalty to be paid for that yeah so and uh, as we go you know into more loser uh, structure uh, the penalty keeps increasing so finite field is you know in some sense the ideal because we don't lose anything uh, but as we as we lose in that structure algebra algebraic structure we we tend to uh, have we need to we need to address uh, we, need, we need to incur some penalty but the idea that uh, <clears throat> we can uh, you know uh, why why one has to use just a shannon style random unstructured course Random unstructured codes was good for point-to-point -point systems, but anything more than two parties would require additional structure in the in the asymptotic uh, you know uh, um, um, in in the in the in the in the systems that achieve asymptotic performance limits. Does that make sense? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions uh, from the audience? Again, feel free to ask questions to clarify doubts. Any questions? <clears throat> All right, so maybe I should proceed to the next part here. Now we are going to look at the uh, the transmission on a quantum channel <clears throat> and how we can do computation over quantum channels. So here we are going to look at the CQ setup, which is classical quantum setup. And again, uh, <clears throat> the computation comes into picture here. So first, let us set up the the notations. So this is the second problem we are we are addressing. So we have a, um, we want to now send information and we want to maximize the amount of information that we want to send. Previously, we were storing information and that's like what we call a source coding or, you know, compression. So we want to minimize the rate of transmission. So here we want to maximize because we are sending information on some noisy channel. And uh, the, the model that we have 
is given by what we call a CQ channel, which takes classical input and quantum output. So this <clears throat> model can be extended to fully quantum system where we takes quantum input and produce a quantum output. But as a first step, we will look at this simpler situation where many of the intuition that we have in the classical setup can be translated. So, so here we have x1 as the input and if you feed x1 as the input, you get a quantum state. That could be for example in optic fiber where you want to send a zero, you set up an optic field and that is being sent over the, the fiber and at the output you receive a quantum, uh, some, some kind of a quantum field, right? quantum state. And the capacity, the problem of finding the capacity was addressed by these folks here, Holevo, Westland, uh, West, uh, I guess West, Westmoreland, and um, I forget the 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 S. Um, um, yeah, Schumacher, I guess. Yes, Schumacher, uh, Holewa, and uh, West, Westmoreland. They they looked at this problem in ninety eight and came up with a computable characterization of the asymptotic performance limit. And the capacity is given by this quantity called Holevo information, which is uh, <clears throat> uh, like a mutual information, but now between classical and quantum. It's it's a hybrid quantity. It takes classical input and produce and you know quantum outputs. And p sub x is the input distribution, and rho x is the state of the system when x is input. And it's computed as difference of one m and entropies. So first is the joint state, average state, you find the entropy of that. The other is the average of the, uh, the one m entropies. So this is going to be, you know, what, what we call a Holevo quantity or Holevo information. And the capacity of the channel is given by this, this, uh, this information quantity. Then came the multiple accessing situation. Uh, so here we have two inputs and there is going to be an interference among the, the inputs and uh, <coughs> so again that could be like uh, so when you're sending again uh, bits on an on a optic, optic fiber there could be interference and what is being sent in you know, multiple channels can you know um, you know they could they could interfere with each other and you get some joint state at the output of the at the, at the output of the optic fiber and you want to decode that information that is being sent. So here x1 and x2 are the inputs and the row x1 comma x2 y is the output and y is the what, what we call the y is the system output uh, system and x1 x2 are the inputs. And what is the capacity of this? So again the capacity was found by Winter in 2001 and for again for all of this people have been using random unstructured codes. Okay. So, uh, so here, if you look at it, uh, in the case of uh, uh, Holevo, um, you know, HSW, um, <clears throat> we have to maximize this Holevo quantity over input distribution. It's a max of the Holevo quantity over input distribution. What is the input distribution? That's the input distribution on the input. And uh, if you want to achieve the capacity, you need to construct codes from that input distribution. That's, you know, in some sense, similar to what, what Shannon did. For the for the fully classical case. Now, in the case of uh, winter for the multiple accessing, again same situation occurs, and uh, <clears throat> we have to now uh, look at these rates which are given by mutual informations here, and all uh, we have to be optimizing this over this state sigma which is written in the bottom, and that's the joint state. And if you now if you ponder over it and if you stare at it for a while, you see that. There is the input distribution on x1, input distribution on x2. And they have to be product because, uh, you know, this is like Alice, Carly and Bob again communicating and Alice and Carly don't talk to each other. So you need to have input distribution, but the, the distributions are not uniform. They could be arbitrary, arbitrary input distributions. Okay. And Winter showed that this is the capacity. And uh, you can note here that this is again a three-party problem. And whenever there is a three party, there is going to be an inter interesting interaction involving computation. So <clears throat> that is what we want to do now. We want to compute over such a channel. The objective now suppose of Bob is only to recover 
a function. Bob doesn't want x1 comma x2. Bob, only, Bob, Bob wants only, only a function. And you might wonder where would you see these kinds of applications? Well, there are a lot of applications. For example, in many uh, classically, it's been studied, you know, extremely, you know, well studied, these kinds of situations. Uh, there are tomes of uh, work written on that. And in the classical setup, you know, for example, wireless sensor networks or interference channel in, in interference networks, we want to only decode the interference. So for example, x1, x2 could be interfering with some x3. And in which case you want to decode the interference, remove it and then decode your message. In which case, you know, you don't want to decode x1, x2. You know, why do you want to do that? If the only interference is from x1 plus x2. Also, it's used in network coding application. <clears throat> We want to send, uh, you know, data streams over wire, wired networks. And, um, uh, you know, now it's not hard to imagine, uh, why, you know, applications in quantum systems, especially in optic uh, systems where we have interference across multiple channels. And in which case we want to remove the interference from some other, you know, X1, X2, some other uh, two people are sending uh, data, even maybe on uh, free space uh, optic uh, communications, for example, we can have uh, situations where x1 and x2 could be the interfering uh, bit streams or uh, data streams and we want to decode that and, and remove it off in which case uh, we don't want to decode the entire information x1 comma x2 of all you know there could be a number of parties out there who are interfering with you so the objective here is the computation and i told you a brief you know uh, ideas to you know, where we could see such applications so i'm now going to tell you what can we do so that we want to maximize the rate of transmission. Now the objective is for the Bob to decode only the sum. Okay. And the question is, can we do better? And again, we have, <coughs> as, as I said earlier, uh, the Connor Martin situation comes into picture. Now it's, it's coming in a different context. And this is when, uh, you know, I told you about this linear course can only compress, uh, you know, uh, can only induce uniform distribution. And, um, you know, for inducing non-uniform distribution, what do you do? So, um, I'll skip this slide here. There is some little technical information here. But I will tell you maybe um, with an example. Because our uh, my time is getting over, I guess, maybe another 8 minutes, 7, seven minutes. So, I want to complete this. So, I'll, I'll, I'll explain this through an example again. So, we'll start with the first simple example. And then we'll make it more and more complicated. So we have x1 and x2, which is, uh, you know, binary uh, in a binary field. And Bob uh, wants to compute x1 plus x2. And let us say the channel is also doing that computation. Okay. So the channel, which is uh, this density operator given x1 comma x2, is indeed depends only on x1 plus x2, let us say. So what the channel does is it actually does first computation x1 plus x2. And then it produces a quantum state. Okay. Simple, simple situation first. So that's what I said. <coughs> Rho of x1 comma x2 is they are, they are the same if x1 plus x2 is same as x1 hat plus x2 hat. In which case, what you can do is you can now treat the entire thing as a point to point communication. Because channel actually does computation for you. So, uh, so Alice and Bob, Alice and Nakali, they want to actually now communicate over this channel and they could, uh, they could, uh, you know, we can think of this as a point to point and uh, we want to now communicate over this via linear code now because uh, that, that should facilitate such a, communi such, such a communication and, uh, you know, there are some technical details here, but uh, we can, you know, we can gloss over it at this point and get the basic idea and which is that we want to communicate over using random linear codes. <clears throat> okay and now everything works out nicely because the channel does computation and uh, you know everything is um, you know so the the the, the uh, alice and carly they will be sending this x1n and x2n which is coming out of a linear code you know g is the generator matrix of the linear code and uh, the addition nicely happens and everything is uh, everything is nice and uh, the, the the induced input distribution would be uniform and if they are okay with that, everything would be okay. Okay. And the key idea here is that, as I said earlier, that 
linear codes facilitate interaction among parties so that if you take two linear codes and if you add them the size will not explode okay <clears throat> and uh, if you do random coding in in such a situation what happens is the size will uh, blow up because if you take two random sets and if you add them the size would be the product the size of the size of the sum would be the size of the product and that's where we want to we want to contain their sum so that we want we don't want to be decoding x1 comma x2 but we want to just decode x1 plus x2 so uh, and uh, <clears throat> as i said there are a lot of many technical details here which i'm going to skip over maybe i'll show you one picture here and then uh, complete uh, uh, in my talk here so uh, the issue of uh, um, the issue of um, the uh, the non uniform distribution so remember i said that if you want to achieve capacity of a, of a channel, you should be able to induce non-uniform distribution because capacity achieving input distribution need not be uniform. And uh, when you do random unstructured codes, what do you do? You choose all the code words from a given distribution. That is something like this. The picture is something like this. So this is all the sequences that, that appear to come from a given distribution. They will all be kind of concentrated in some region of the space. So random unstructured codes look like this, chosen from a given distribution. Whereas random linear codes, they look like that. Because the unstructured, the, because it's linear, they cannot be constrained to lie in a given region. Okay. So <clears throat> to induce a non-uniform distribution, what we need is a pair of linear codes. Okay. So here, I, I give uh, the basic idea through one, one, one cartoon here. So if you now look at this, look at the, look at the, 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 the right hand side, you can now see that this is a cartoon of a two linear codes. When it, there is a dense linear code, which is all the dense red points. And then there is this sparse linear code, which is all the black points. And they are nested in the sense that uh, one is a subset of the other. So what we can do now is to choose only code words which are in this region because we want to make we want to achieve capacity. We want structure, we want to we want to still be able to achieve capacity. And one way to do that is to look at this set, and you can imagine now that this set is a set of coset representatives of the coarse code in the fine code. That's the idea. So one way is to achieve randomly like this using the given distribution, then there won't be any structure. You can't uh, affect any computation. But if you do a direct one linear code, the code words will be just all over the place. You don't get that the non-uniform non-uniformity. But if you do two linear codes, you get uh, you get uh, the best of both worlds. Like it's like eating, you know, having cake and eating it too. Okay, you can induce a non-uniform distribution, yeah, and you also get the structure. I think with that, I will stop here. And again, once again, I, will I, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for giving this opportunity to present this work with you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Sandeep. Great talk. Questions, guys?